Now, how many of you know the billboard that Caleb was talking about? Did you notice it was quickly covered up? <laughs> No, as Caleb said, uh, uh, I had made the change from banking uh, back to preaching. I had uh, uh, started out years ago, first of all, in banking, stumbling across a job at a bank when I was in high school, uh, way back when. Uh, stayed with it through the end of high school, through college, and then a number of years after, and uh, uh, working at some banks in Joplin. Uh, and then transitioned out of banking into full-time preaching, uh, and now I guess would you would say have come full circle and transitioned back to banking, first of all at Arvest, uh, eventually at Arvest here in the Osho, and, and now at Community Bank and Trust, also here in the Osho, working at the one on the square. But the Arvest billboard with my picture on it, thankfully, <laughs> uh, got covered up uh, pretty quickly. I am surprised when they put that up initially, I said the sale of eggs and tomatoes is about to go up in the Osho, but no one vandalized it, uh, but, uh, but now it is gone. But I, I appreciate being here tonight and, and sincerely thank you uh, for the invite and uh, 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 being in this spot of, of starting off the summer series. I'll try to get through it to the point that I don't make people think, well, if it's always going to be like that, then we're not coming back for the rest of the series. <laughs> but uh, uh, we'll, we'll try to... Uh, uh, d try to do a little bit of justice to a marvelous text tonight. Uh, if you open up to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, uh, we're going to be focusing on my assigned verses was 8 through 11. Uh, as you'll see on the screen, I'm going to focus primarily on verses 8 through 10, uh, but we'll include these other verses as well. Uh, what I want to do, first of all, is just read our text, uh, Philippians chapter 3. And to read it, let's read verses 7 through 11. Uh, I told you to Philippians 3, and I'm looking at Hebrews 12. So give me just a moment. In Philippians chapter 3, let's begin in verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for His sake. I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead." Uh, I'm not sure who was responsible for deciding the topic of your theme, but uh, I think it's a, a marvelous theme. What better topic than Jesus, right? More about Jesus. And so tonight is the idea of knowing Jesus more. Now, when you, when you look at these verses that we just read here, just real briefly, um, I want you to notice, and I'm sure that you did, uh, that Paul is contrasting some words here. He's doing a little bit of a play on words, certainly emphasizing some words. Uh, and, and look at verse 7, if you would. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. And so we see this comparison, we see this contrast here for these several verses, uh, gain and loss. As a matter of fact, as you know, the, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and no, I'm not going to appeal to Greek a lot tonight because I would click, quickly run out of my knowledge of it. Um, but uh, it's interesting because in the Greek, word order is not nearly as significant as it is in English. When we come to our English sentences, we expect our, our sentences to follow, for the most part, a particular order. In the Greek, that's not the case. You can rearrange the words, jumble them up, and still come up with the same sentence. But I wanted to do something here just real quickly. I wanted to show you what verse 7, let's see if I can, oh, I probably need to turn this on, don't I? There we go. All right. And so we see this, uh, this play on words. Do I need to, yeah, there we go. Between gain and loss. And, and if we were to take verse 7 and read it basically as it appears in the word order in the Greek, it would look something like this. But what things were to me gain, those I counted for Christ, loss. 
that's not the word order we would do. Like if, if we took this, but whatever things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. And the words gain and loss are kind of get lost, again, just kind of mixed in the middle of the sentences, right? But Paul arranged the, this particular sentence in a way that it, it, it brings focus and significance on which two words? Gain and loss. And so right here at verse 7, he's drawing some extra attention to these particular words. He wants us to think about, he's going to contemplate his own gain and his own loss. Uh, he wants us to do the same, right? What are some things, and, and I'm not looking for a response in particular. I hope to have some input and discussion here in a moment. But uh, when you think about your own life, uh, what are some things that you would put in the column of gain? What are some things that might be loss? And then when we think about that in terms of our Christianity, we think about that in terms of, uh, of, of Jesus and getting to know Jesus more, what are the types of things that should be considered gain? What are the types of things that should be considered loss? I think that's what Paul is contemplating here, and I think it's encouraging us to contemplate the same thing. So in verse 7 again, gain and loss. In verse 8, uh, you see indeed I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth. And so you see the contrast there. But also in verse 8, he uses loss and gain again. Uh, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may what? Gain Christ. Now, I'm going to use banking for an example for for just a moment. Uh, When you go into a bank to get a loan, what do you have to fill out? Other than providing a vial of blood and hair for DNA samples, those types of things, uh, uh, what paperwork do you have to do? An application, right? Well, what's the purpose of that application? Well, obviously, to see if you qualify for a loan, but what type of information do you put on that application? What gain you get income. How do you spend it? How much of it goes out on payments? If you're a business, it's not necessarily an application. It's what's called a profit and loss statement. It's your gain. It's your loss, how those compare. Uh, It looks at assets and liabilities, whether it's a personal financial statement, an application, a balance sheet. Uh, We're used to this idea of gain and loss, assets and liabilities. Uh, And so if you go into a bank and you're willing to fill out all that paperwork, the goal is what? A loan, right? Money, funds, funds to use, maybe to buy something, maybe to consolidate, maybe to pay something else off, whatever the, the use. Okay. Well, Paul's talking about gain and loss here, but obviously he's not talking about money. He's not trying to get a loan. What's his goal? Look at Philippians 3 again. What's the goal? Now, ultimately, you get to verses 10 and 9, and he's talking about things that he wants to attain. Uh, He he acknowledges that he's not there yet. There's still things that were in process. But it's not verses 10 and 11 that I have in mind yet. There's something else that is his goal. There's something that he wants to obtain. What is it? Look at verse 9. See, he's used verse 7 and he's used verse 8 to set up this this word play, to set up this concept of gain and loss, to contrast the two. And then we get to verse 9, and what is it that Paul is after? What is it that he hopes for? Righteousness. 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 Look again at verse 9. He says, he wants to be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That's what he's after, right? Because he needs to have that righteousness in order to obtain what he's ultimately after, and we'll get to that if we have time here at the end, in verses 10 and 11. But what does Paul recognize as an absolute necessity for righteousness? Before we answer that, let's just talk about righteousness in general. From what Paul has said here, what do we learn or what do we know about righteousness? What is righteousness? Righteousness. 
Okay, being right, there's the root word of righteousness, is right, being right with God. And if I understand right, long, long ago, righteousness used to be spelled more like right wiseness. That's hard to say. That developed into righteousness. And so it's being wise regarding that which is right, okay? Not only knowing what is right, but what else? Yeah, okay, knowing what's not right, okay, so which column? Is this something that's right? Is this something that's not right? And it's not only a knowledge of it, but what? An action, practice. Practicing that which is right. Pursuing that which is right. Conforming to that which is right, okay? Um, okay, what, what else do we see here in verse 9 about righteousness? Okay, righteousness is not meritorious. We don't merit it. In other words, we don't what? We don't earn it, and we don't deserve it. So can we be righteous of our own doing? No. And that's what Paul says here, right? It's not a righteousness of his own. It's not something that he could do by himself. It's not something that he could merit. It's not something that he deserved. And so, since that's the case, what else do we know about righteousness? Yeah, if you don't earn it, you don't deserve it, but you can still have it, it must be a gift. Okay. And so, it's something that is offered to us. It's something that is given to us. Okay. And what, what's some other thoughts that come from that? So, if it's, if it's offered to us and we can't earn it, it's offered to us and we don't deserve it, what other biblical concept must be hand in hand with righteousness? Okay, yeah, there's a cost. Okay, now, see, now we're back to gain and loss. We're back to the, the idea of values and, and the cost. Okay, and we'll come back to that uh, here in a while if I forget to remind me. Uh, um, what else do we know then about righteousness? It, it aligns with some other qualities or, or, or attributes that we find in Scripture. If we get something we don't deserve, we normally put that under what ca uh, category? Grace, right? How do we normally define grace in a very general sense? Unmerited favor, unmerited gift. And so without the grace of God, could we have the hope of being considered righteous? No. Because without God's grace, righteousness would ultimately depend on who? you and me, and we can't do it. Now, we can be good people. We ought to be good people, right? But can we qualify for righteousness in its purest form on our own? Absolutely not. Why not? I didn't purposely point at you. but uh, <laughs> um, Why not? What keeps us from being righteous on our own? We're imperfect. Because the only way we could be righteous of our own doing would be to be perfect. Never make a mistake, never fall short, never give in to temptation. Never do that which is wrong, never fail to do that which is right, right? Okay. We'd have to be perfect. Well, we all know that we're not there. Paul recognized that he was not there. So, what is absolutely necessary let's let's say let's say it this way who is absolutely necessary for us to have the hope of being considered righteous okay god okay so god puts this plan together that makes righteousness available to you and me and who is the key person in that plan jesus so when we look at this situation where paul is counting loss and gain um, he's talking about things that he's done in his own life. We'll talk about that here in just a moment. But what I want us to see first here, since the theme is Jesus, and it's knowing more about Jesus, what we need to understand from Philippians chapter 3 is that Paul is, is reminding us uh, of something we already know, but something we need to be reminded of, something we need to be thinking about, uh, not just now and then, but on a regular basis. I 
you absolutely need Jesus. Is that a message this world of ours needs to hear? Absolutely. All too often, what does the world do in regards to Jesus? The opposite. Okay, there's some that argue against him. There's some that argue against his historicity. There's some that have all kinds of different ideas and themes, and they try to discredit the very concept of Jesus and the truth regarding him. What do others do? Even if maybe they don't argue against or deny Jesus, what's the world in general do in regards to Jesus? Yeah, they just kind of push him aside, right? Why is that? Are they focused more on self, more on their own life? You know, life isn't easy. <laughs> there's a lot of challenges. There's, there's, there's problems. There's uh, just, you know, the everyday ins and outs of life. And if we're not careful, we kind of get focused on that and we forget about, we kind of brush aside, we kind of put on the back burner Jesus, right? Well, Paul in, in this passage is showing how he has absolutely prioritized Jesus in his life. He understood that he absolutely had to have Jesus in his life. Without Jesus in his life, he is in the category of unrighteous. If we do not have Jesus in our lives, what category are we in? Unrighteous. If we are in the category of unrighteous, what relationship do we have with the Heavenly Father? We don't. So we need to be aiming for this category of righteous, right? It's absolutely vital in our lives. But we can't do it on our own. We can't reach that goal of righteousness of our own doing. So we absolutely have to have Jesus. It is crucial. It is vital. Whatever other words you want to add there, we must have Jesus in our lives. And that's something we need to be mindful of on a regular basis, right? So let's reread those verses again. Verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. Why? Paul says, for the sake of... Of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of what? The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have suffered the loss of all things? For his sake. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may what? Gain Christ. See, he's setting up this contrast to gain and loss, but while he's doing that, he's telling us, Jesus, 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 Jesus. He's putting so much emphasis here on Jesus. And then he says in verse 9 that if he can be found in him, in who? In Jesus, in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, Paul had realized, come to realize, that wasn't a possibility. But he says, but that righteousness, which comes through faith in who? In Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on what? Faith. faith. I think about Romans chapter 4. There's a lot of similarities with some of Paul's writings in Romans and the concepts that we find here in, in, in Philippians chapter 3. But in Romans chapter 4, he's using the example of Abraham. And Abraham was considered what in the sight of God? Righteous. He was counted as righteous. And we're told why. Why? Because of his faith. Because of his faith, he was counted righteous. So we have to be careful how we represent righteousness, right? Because if we start emphasizing the fact that it involves an, an obedient faith, which it does... We need to have an accurate, obedient, growing faith to aim for that righteousness, right? But if we emphasize that aspect of righteousness, can it start to, even if it's not really or not intended to, can it start to sound like a righteousness that you deserve 
or a righteousness that you've earned or salvation by works. Um, not saying that that's the way we represent it, but we need to have a balanced approach to the concept of righteousness. Does it matter what we do? Absolutely, because we need to have proper faith. But we still, even with proper faith, cannot do nearly enough to earn the label of righteous. It still depends on who? Jesus. So we need to, we need to try to balance an obedient faith with the grace of God because we have to have both, right? And I think we see that here with Paul. Now then, um, we could talk more about righteousness, but I want, to, I want us to look. Uh, we see where Paul, and, and I'll do this. I'll put slides together, and then I don't remember to hit the button. But here we see in verse 10, Paul says that I may know him. Okay, so notice here in verse 8, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. In verse 8 also, that I may gain Christ. In verse 9, I may be found in him. And then in verse 10, that I may know him. And, and, and after all, this is our, our topic, knowing Jesus more. What's that mean? What's it mean to know Jesus? When we, when we see the word know, oftentimes we think of what? And I'm not looking for a right or wrong answer here. What, what comes to mind when you see the word know, to know Jesus? Okay, to know about Jesus, right? To know about his life. Okay, what else? Okay, a knowledge about Jesus and who he is and what he stands for and the things that he's done. Okay, uh, what else? And so I think oftentimes when we think about knowing Jesus, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying this isn't valid, I'm not trying to criticize it, we think about knowledge, right? What did Jesus say in the Great Commission, I'm sorry, the Great Invitation, Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30? Do you remember what he says? Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. At the end of that, he says what? And you may learn, right? Learn of me. But that's not the path I'm going to go down because Michael Middleton has been assigned that topic for, I think, June, I can't remember now, I think the 30th. And it's learn about Jesus more. I don't think that's what Paul is talking about here when he talks about knowing Jesus. Now, that's involved, don't get me wrong. Uh, if, you, if you're going to know Jesus in the way that Paul is saying here, you're going to need to have some knowledge of Jesus. But how else can the word know be used in the Scriptures? Not regarding knowledge, but regarding... Okay, and, and, and that true, a, a perception and understanding, uh, having that knowledge and then understanding what it is you've learned, having the wisdom then to apply it. But I think it's important to understand too that the word know also can mean relationship. I want to share a quote with you here. Um, I think I put it on this. No, I didn't put it on the screen. I'm just going to read it to you. This comes from the Word Biblical Commentary. Uh, the, the commentary on Philippians was written by a man named Gerald Hawthorne. And I think he makes a very good observation here. He says, It should be noted that the verb to know in its other forms often focus attention upon the ideas of understanding, but also experience and intimacy. Even the intimacy of the sexual relationship in a marriage. And that's where a husband knows his wife, as it's depicted in the Scripture. But hence, when Paul speaks of his desire to know Christ, he does not have in mind a mere intellectual knowledge about Christ. Rather, he is thinking about a personal encounter with Christ that inaugurates a special intimacy with Christ that is life-changing and ongoing. Paul's not content merely to know Christ as a fact of history, but to know Him personally as the resurrected, ever-living Lord of His life. I want to read that last statement. Paul is not content merely to know Christ as a fact of history, but to know Him personally as the resurrected, ever-living Lord of His life. Jesus is Lord over all, right? 
does that mean he's Lord of our own lives? He's Lord over everybody and everything, but there's a lot of people in this world that don't acknowledge that, right? We need to acknowledge that and live accordingly. Isn't that what Paul's saying? When did Paul, when was the moment that Paul recognized that truth about Jesus? Road to Damascus. He was on the way to Damascus to do what? Persecute Christians. On the way, Jesus appears to him. And Paul, at that moment, I can't imagine what went through that man's mind. But at that moment, he realizes what? He has been wrong. And the message that the Christians had been telling about Jesus was right. That he is, in fact, the resurrected Lord. Did that have much impact on Paul? <laughs> That's what caused him to do what he talks about here in Philippians 3, right? To count all things for loss. Why? Because all of a sudden he realizes that Jesus is true. And he realizes that he must have a proper relationship with Jesus. Without that, he is lost. Without that, he cannot have righteousness. Without that, he is lost in his sin with no hope. And so Paul wanted to have, and he wanted to continue to have, a relationship with Jesus at any cost. Did it cost Paul much to have a relationship with Jesus? Let's back up a little bit. By the way, what? I didn't pay attention when I started. What time do I need to stop? <laughs> I've got 10 minutes? Oh, boy. Okay. I've got 20 minutes of things to say in 10 minutes. No, that's okay. I'm used to that. That's all, it happens all the time. Uh, look at, go back to verse 2. Paul says, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And when we look at the context, we can see that he's warning the, the flipping Christians about Jewish teachers, Judaizers, right? And he says something that's unusual here, at least I think so. In verse 3, he says, for we are the what? Circumcision. When you see the word circumcision, that's usually aimed at who? That's usually describing who? The Jews. And there's usually the contrast, the circumcision versus the uncircumcision. So why does Paul say we are the circumcision? Well, when you think about circumcision, it is in its true form what? The cutting away of flesh. Cutting away. Paul was willing to cut some things out of his life in order for Christ. He's recognizing that in the life of the Christians at Philippi. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, <coughs> excuse me, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And then Paul says he did what with all of that? Counted it loss. Now that put Paul in a very privileged position amongst the Jews, didn't it? He had so much going for him amongst the Jews. He was a leader, he was respected, he was privileged. But what was the problem? What was the problem with all that? He was lost. And why was he lost? Because those things were keeping him away from Christ rather than leading him to Christ. Now, now don't get me wrong. Uh, being a Jew and under the law, the law pointed to Christ. The, it, it, uh, it, it led them to Jesus. They just didn't recognize that oftentimes. And so Paul, if you were to ask him prior to the road to Damascus, Paul, are you a righteous man? What would he have answered? Absolutely. In all good conscience, yes. Paul felt he was righteous. But what was the problem? He was lacking Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no righteousness. Not for us, not under the new covenant. And so Paul came to realize that, right? And so what does he do with all these things that stood in the way? He 
counts them as rubbish. Here's a question I have for you, and I'm not looking for any answers. But to know Jesus more. Now, if we're talking about know as a relationship, then that means what? Building that relationship, right? Growing closer to Jesus, drawing nearer, right? More about Jesus, knowing Jesus more. Okay, if that's the case, okay, and that's what we're aiming for, that's what we want to do, are there some things that can stand in the way of that? Well, of course, right? And we could come up with a whole list, right, of things that could serve as obstacles, things that could stand in the way. And there's a lot of things that for people of this world stand in the way of them starting a relationship with Jesus, right? Because maybe they don't know, they don't understand. Maybe they're misled, maybe they're just wrapped up in their own lives. Maybe they don't understand the need for Jesus. There's a whole list of things we could come up with. But what about us as Christians? Those who have responded to the gospel, don't we want to know Jesus more? Don't we want to get to know Him better? Don't we want to draw closer to Him? Don't we want to grow in that relationship in Christ? Are there some things that could stand in the way of that? Sure. And it's going to be different for each of us. Things that we have on our schedules, things that we deal with, things that are obstacles, things that we struggle with, whatever the case may be. But from what we've seen, what Paul writes here, Paul suggests he urges us to do what regarding those things? Put them in what column? Loss. All these things that Paul talks about in his former life as a Jew they would have been under which column? Gain. But he found out that's not the column they belonged in. They belonged in the lost column because they were in the way of his relationship with Jesus. Is there something in your way regarding your relationship with Jesus? I would urge you then, work on moving it. If you've got it in the gain column, work on moving it to the lost column. Does being a Christian, having that relationship with Jesus cost us some things along the way? Sure it does. It's different for each of us. Is it worth the cost? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, uh, let's, let's move on quickly. There's more I could say there about that. But I want us to notice one thing. I think this is kind of fascinating. If I remember where I'm at on my slides. Okay, going back to the Greek, there's what's called the perfect tense where, oops, there's supposed to be something. There it is, okay. The perfect tense in the Greek references something that is a past action, but it's not emphasizing the action per se. It's emphasizing the fact that there's a continuing result, a lasting result. That's the tense that Paul uses in verse 7 when he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted, perfect tense, I counted as loss, meaning what? Paul, sometime in his past, had come to that point where he said, you know what, these things are standing in my way of a proper relationship with Jesus, I'm going to count them as loss. Guess what? He didn't change his mind. He didn't waver on that. He didn't go back and forth. He made that decision, and the results of that were lasting. He still counted those things as loss. Why? Because of the surpassing worth of Christ, so that he could found, be found in him, so that he could know Jesus, so that he could have that relationship. But then what's fascinating, though, is Paul shifts in verse 8. Because in verse 8, he uses the present tense. Indeed, I count everything as loss. To get the present tense, we could say, Indeed, I am counting everything is loss. Paul had a point in his life where he made that decision and he stuck to it. And so he made the decision, I'm going to have a relationship with Jesus. And if there's some things I need to count as loss to do it, I'm going to. We all need to reach that point in our lives, right? And begin that process, begin that relationship with Jesus. But then we need to presently, each and every day, continue that pattern, right? 
Because what can happen if we let our guard down? Something gets in the way. Something climbs up the chart of priorities. And if we're not careful, it bumps Jesus down. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we're supposed to, well, let's turn over there just real quick. I think I'm about out of time, but we can squeeze this in. In Hebrews chapter 12, in verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Notice Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, which may be Paul, um, he talks about two things there. Something that serves as a weight. If you're trying to run and you have a weight, what's that do? It holds you back, it slows you down, right? What's Paul say? Or well, sorry, what's the writer, the Hebrew writer say? Cast that off. But notice the second category is sin. So there's things that can weigh us down that are not intrinsically sinful. There's things that can hold us back that are not intrinsically sinful. But we can let those things get in the way. And it can hurt our relationship with Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says, cast those things aside and run the race with endurance. Now, regarding this perfect and present tense, I'm going back to Hawthorne in the World Word Bible Commentary. He says, this change from the perfect tense to the present tense of the same verb is deliberate. In it, Paul is saying that the settled decision he made in the past as a result of careful reflection is not enough. It must be reinforced daily by continuous conscience moral choices against depending upon himself. Who he, who he is, the things he possesses, what he has accomplished for gaining favor with God. He considers all things as loss, whatever they may be, that might compete with Christ for his allegiance. Do you know Jesus? Have you entered into a relationship with Jesus? I hope you have. If not, you need to. If you've entered into a relationship with Jesus, are you building it? Are you drawing closer to Jesus? Are you making that a stronger relationship? Are you willing to count some things lost along the way? Are you willing to cast some things aside because of the surpassing worth of Jesus and being found in Him that you may know Him? Now, there's a lot in verses 10 and 11 that we haven't even touched. Talking about the resurrection of Jesus and the sufferings of Jesus. There's different ideas exactly what Paul means there. I think it parallels very well with Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. And I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to close with those verses. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. And I want you to think about the, this idea of the resurrection of Jesus and Paul wanting to attain that and saying, I haven't quite yet, I'm not there yet. I think he's talking ultimately about the final resurrection, the ultimate resurrection, but he's also talking about the resurrected life. And we see that in Romans 6, 3 and 4. Okay, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried therefore with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's the life Paul was living, right? A new life. For if we have been united with Him in death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life He lives, He lives to God. Now notice this. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, what's counted as loss, and alive to God, the ultimate gain, in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul was aiming for. That's what he continued to work on. That's what he wants us to aim for. And understand, now, now you have an invitation now? Okay. Not now, later. Okay, all right. So I will stop there. There's so much more we could talk about, and I hope I didn't rush through that too quickly. Uh, but what is it that we may need to count as loss 
in order to gain and know Christ.